But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite in spirit, who trembles at my word. But to those who kill an ox, it's like slaying a man. He who sacrifices a lamb is like the one who breaks a dog's neck. It's a reminder from these verses that we don't come before the Lord in worship and study out of routine. We come to be humble before Him, to be contrite and to tremble, study and submit to His Word. We have a great and awesome God we serve. Our main text this morning is going to be Luke chapter 14. So go in your Bibles there to Luke chapter 14. We're going to focus in on Luke 14, verse 25 to 35. That will be our main text. Although we're going to a number of other places, so have your thumbs and your minds ready to go. But Luke 14, verse 25 to 35, the focus is on the cost of being a Christian. The focus is on the cost of following Christ. We will be instructed, we will be urged, we will be warned to pick up our cross, to count the cost, and to follow Jesus Christ, no matter what. It will be a high cost that we have to pay many times. But please don't misunderstand. Salvation is free. We just sing about that in a couple of songs. Salvation is free. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Every single one of us, according to the Scripture, is a sinner. In action, in thought, in motive, in heart. And the wages of sin is death. In eternity and hell separated from God. That's what we deserve. That's the wage that we've earned for our sins. But the good news is the free gift of God's eternal life in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus has become a man. He lived without sinning. And He went to the cross to be crucified for me, for you, to pay for our sins on the cross. He rose again on the third day. He lives today as I speak to you. He's returning someday, and now salvation is being declared in His name to any who will repent and believe. It's given as a free gift. It's all of God's grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, hopefully verses you know by heart. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not a result of works. Many other verses in the Scripture make clear to be justified, to be forgiven, is a free gift of God. You must repent. Change your mind and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Luke, and even in the book of Luke, Luke 19.10. Many have identified Luke 19.10 as the key verse or the theme verse. You can argue about that maybe. But in Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost, which is all of us. Salvation is free. But in a different sense, salvation will cost you everything. And that's the focus of the text we'll be in this morning. Salvation may cost you greatly, not in the sense that you earn it or buy it or merit it. You can't. I can't. We're sinners. We're hopeless. We're hopeless on our own. But to truly follow Christ, to be identified with Him in this world, might mean and will mean surrender to Him and suffering for His name's sake. And you can't come to Christ on your own terms. He offers a free salvation to all. You can't pick and, pick and choose the parts of Him you like and the parts you don't like. You can't make a Jesus of your own imagination and think you can be saved by Him. You must come to Him as who He is on His terms. Sometimes we talk about the fact that you can't come to salvation just as fire insurance. You must follow Jesus Christ believing in Him. So let's read our text this morning, Luke 14, 25 to 35. Now large crowds are going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you... When he wants to build a tower, he does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation, he does not have enough to finish. All who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build, but is unable to finish. Or the king, who has set out to meet another king in battle, 
will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciples who does not give up all his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, then what will be seasoned? It is useless, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has an ear, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Did you notice as we read through that three times in verse 26, 27, and 33? He says, you cannot be my disciple. Verse 26, verse 27, and verse 33. This passage lays out some of the requirements of being a disciple of Christ. Question, very important question for us though. What is a disciple? What is a disciple of Jesus Christ? One online dictionary said this. A person, follow, a personal follower of Jesus during his life, especially one of the twelve. That's probably the common way many of us use the term disciple. The twelve disciples, those who followed Christ during his earthly ministry. But that's too narrow of a definition to understand the term biblically. A disciple, the Greek word mathetes, is simply a learner. A learner, a student, a pupil. Not in the sense of some of you students in philosophy class or in math class, you sit there and you learn the material, and you know, the only reason you're interested in geometry is to get the grade. You don't care about the geometry or in philosophy class some of you taking. You, know, you don't care about really what Plato believed and thought you're not trying to follow him. You're just trying to get a grade. That's not the idea of being a student here. It's being a student, a learner, who truly wants to understand, submit to, and follow. Not just a student as in today's students in high school and in college. It's one who's committed to. Go to Acts chapter 11. Important verse here. Acts chapter 11. They're disciples of John the Baptist in the scripture, disciples, learners of the Pharisees. But here we're talking about disciples of Christ. Acts 11, verse 26, very important verse. Paul, when he had found him, uh, Barnabas finds Paul, I believe here, he brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year he met with the church and taught considerable numbers. Now know this, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. In the scripture, a disciple is a Christian. Some think that discipleship or being a disciple is a second step in the Christian life. There's Christians, all believers, all those forgiven, and then there is the real radical ones, the disciples. Or some type of that thinking can sneak in sometimes. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. So every Christian, every true believer is a disciple. The term, you go back to Luke 14, the term disciple is only used, Matthew's, it's only used in the gospel and in Acts. Then that term falls away. Other terms are picked up, Christian, believer, brother, terms like that. But the verb form of this noun, manthano, is used throughout the epistles. It makes clear that believers of all ages, believers today, we are learners of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 4.20 talk about we learn in Christ. It's the, same, the word learn there is the same as the verb form of a noun disciple. We're learners of Jesus Christ. Every Christian is a disciple, is a learner of Christ Jesus. Now we must continue in the thing we've learned. Paul tells Timothy, we must, we must guard against those who would corrupt it, turn aside from it. We must keep learning and growing in our doctrine and our living out the truth. <coughs> But we are disciples. We are learners. This is why we're studying the Word right now. It's not the most fun thing, maybe, on an outward way to be doing right now. But we love it. We study God's Word. We want to know it. We want to understand it. We want to handle it accurately. We want to hold to it. We want to guard it. We want to grow in it. We want to pass it on to others. You know, we want to be people who will master this book, or to put it better, maybe, those who are mastered by the word of God. We are learners of Jesus Christ. Back in Luke 14, he's going to talk about the requirements of being a disciple. 
But it's in up front. A disciple is a Christian. So these are requirements of being a true Christian. And he breaks it down the way we'll, we'll see. Though, there's three non-negotiable requirements of, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ listed in this text. Those three times he said, you can't be my disciple unless this. Three requirements to be a Christian. We're also going to see three illustrations. Two illustrations in the middle that focus on the fact that we must count the cost. And one illustration that we'll conclude with that warn us if we what happens if we don't. Then he'll end, Christ will end with really a call, an invitation to all those who will hear. Verse 25, we see the setting. Verse 25. Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, We're in Christ's ministry here, obviously, which is a few months from his execution by crucifixion. This is sometimes called the later Korean or Judean ministry. And in the Gospel of Luke, really most of chapter 9 to 19 is a unique to Luke. It's not in Matthew or Mark, the other synoptics. And some have called this section from Luke 9.51 to most of chapter 19, the journey to Jerusalem. Because Christ is determined to go to Jerusalem. He's going to his crucifixion. He's been rejected. And throughout the section... There's a focus on him being rejected and him teaching his disciples what to expect and teaching on discipleship, on being a disciple. And there's large crowds in verse 25. You know, Christ was very, very popular. Sometimes he had to get in a boat so he could teach the people. You know, we know at times crowds were pushing around him so much that someone touched into him and was healed and no one knew who touched him. Who touched me? The other times... The story of a paralytic, they kind of get to him, so what do they do? They go up in the house and tear through the guy's roof to get to Jesus Christ. Really, masses, thousands of people followed him. And we have the story of the feeding of the four and five thousands, probably men there. So thousands of people following him. And he turns, and he's going to say some hard things to them. You know, why are all these people here? We don't know all of them. But many of the people are there just to see a, a miracle show. Many people... Wanting to be able to see the kingdom come in right away. And that's not a bad thought in and of itself, but if they're not willing to accept Christ as who he is, that's a bad thought. And sometimes people just crowd around because there's a crowd. I was away a few months ago in a place. There was a, apparently a fantastic crate store. I never stopped by, but I wanted to. Every time I went by it, it was this long line going out the door. Sometimes people would just gather because other people were gathered. We have a mass of people here. He turns to them, and he's going to say some very difficult things. One, fake news, Christian fake news site, a really uh, comedic, uh, satirical site, had a headline that said this, Church growth experts cringe at Jesus' sermons in the Gospels. Because what Christ is going to say doesn't fit in with a lot of uh, pragmatic church growth understanding philosophies. Christ doesn't want people to be confused. Now, he's going to say some hard things. He doesn't say these things because he just wants a smaller group. He doesn't say these things because he's a cruel taskmaster. He's concerned for the people. He's concerned for the large crowd around him. That some haven't truly understood who he is and haven't become true followers of him. So he is concerned for them. You know, Christ doesn't try to hide the requirements of being a Christian. He doesn't do the old bait and switch. Many times he lets people know right up front. You follow me, it will, it's the only wise option. It's the only way to have salvation. The only way to have forgiveness and glory. But understand, <coughs> there is difficulty that will come in this world. So verse 26, we're going to see the first requirement, the first non-negotiable. Verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brother and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. The first thing is, we must love Jesus Christ most. He must be number one. He must be number one. Verse 26, if anyone does not hate, if anyone does not hate those closest to him, he cannot be my disciple. And he lists six of the closest human family relationships. But he's not saying here they must literally hate one another in their family. 
He's not saying they have to have ill will, dislike, disdain, and malice in their heart towards others. You know, come here, Dad, come here, Isaiah, I'm just going to punch you in the face. I hate that. The point is that compared to their love for Jesus Christ, their devotion to Him, their allegiance to Him, even the closest human relationships could be compared to hate. You know, Christians are told to love one another. Husbands are told to love their wives as Christ loved the church. <coughs> Older women are teach the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children. You know, there's a, a normal and a good family love that we have for one another. And for believers, love is a defining mark of who we are. First John, you see that again and again and again. <coughs> believers do love one another. If you don't love specifically fellow believers in First John, the brethren, if you don't love God. So believers are characterized by love and love for God and love for believers go hand in hand. The second greatest commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. But that's not the first commandment. The first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Who so says here, you must hate these family relationships. It's a relative sense, a comparative sense. And I think he uses that word to show it's not just I must be number one and everyone else second place, but you know, almost competing for your allegiance. He's saying, I must be your all. Others can't compete. Go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew has a, a similar text. Different situation in Matthew chapter 10. But a similar truth. In Matthew 10, Christ is sending out the twelve to go minister. Let's pick up in Matthew 10, 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses me, he's talking about the difficulty, the hardships of discipleship, of following him here as well. Different context, though. Pick up verse 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father in heaven. Do not think I came to bring peace on the earth. Peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. What do you mean? We're supposed to do holy war? Pick up our sword and go slaughters? No, what's he talking about? The sword of division, verse 35. For I came to set man against his father, daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his household. Christ says, I'm the dividing line. I'm the sword. And this has happened many, many times since Christ has said this. Someone comes to Christ, they follow him, and there's a division in the family. There's a person who loves Jesus Christ to follow him, and there are those who are still children of the devil. He brings division. This happens again and again and again. Verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So same truth as Luke 14. I'm going to bring division. There's going to be conflict. But you must love me most. If you don't, you can't be my disciple. You can't be saved. Go to, go back to Luke. Don't go back to Luke yet, actually. We must love him most. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare. But he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Many people live in fear of others. What others think, what others are going to say about them. Maybe especially family members, those closest to them. The fear of man brings a snare. <coughs> you fear man more than you fear God, you love man more than you love God, you will fall. Go to John 14. Go back to Luke, keep going to John 14. John 14. Our love for Jesus Christ is proven, is shown by our obedience to Him. John 14, verse 15. And we can't do this on our own. We need to be relying on the Lord's strength to do this in prayer. The verses preceding talk about it must be the power of the Holy Spirit within us as the following verses talk about the helper within us. But verse 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It says the same thing in verse 21 and 23. Verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, 
If anyone loves me, he will keep my commandments. And the negative side in verse 24. He who does not love me does not keep my commandments. Our love for the Lord is proven and it's shown by obedience to Him. Every time we have an opportunity to obey the Lord or not obey the Lord, our love is tested. Who are we going to love? What are we going to do? When family members say, you shouldn't follow Christ. And this is the real pressure. What are you going to do? Go to, go back to Luke. You know, in our day in the West, we might think, well, you know, you come to Christ, not that much will happen to you. Many people in this day and through church history they come to Christ, they truly come to the true Christ of the Bible. It means difficulty. We'll make clear in the next verse. But before we look back to Luke 14, turn to Luke 17. Our love and our obedience to the Lord, it can't be, I'm going to pick and choose what I want to obey and what I don't want to obey. Luke 17, look at verse 7 to 9, 7 to 10. Which of you, having, sit, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he comes in from the field, Come immediately and sit down and eat? Well, will he not say to him, Prepare something for me to eat, and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterwards you may eat and drink? He does not thank this lady because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all things which are commanded of you, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we have ought to have done. We can't pick and choose what we're going to obey and not obey. Go back to Luke 14. Christ must be more important than the most intimate, the closest relationships. And that's proved by who we're going to obey, who we care about the most. Now our love isn't perfect, obviously. James says we all stumble in many portions. We stumble in many ways. First John talks about assurance the believer can have through the love produced in their life, through their belief, through their obeying the Lord. talks about the fact that we're still going to sin. But the blood of Christ for the believer continually cleanses us from all sin. What's the pattern of life? Verse 26, we're making real fast progress, aren't we? Verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate, that word hate there is in the present tense. We're going to see in a minute, Lord willing, there is an initial count on the cost for the believer up front. But this first love must remain. It can't wane. So hate's present This must continue. Again, not the real hate, but he must be more important. Also note in verse 26, he says, If anyone comes to me, who is saying this? Jesus Christ is saying this. Go back in the time machine 2,000 years ago. You're standing there. Who are you looking at? Well, with your physical eyes, you're looking at a man. A mere, uh, with your physical eyes, you only see a human being. Isaiah says, He had no state in form or majesty that we should appear, that we should look on him. You know, with the thousands of people gathered around Christ as he turns to them and says this, Well, who are you? You're just a man. But we know that he is not just a mere man, he is the God man, Jesus Christ. He says, it must be me that is most important. It must be Jesus Christ himself. <clears throat> there are many, many other verses in the New Testament talk about our devotion, our allegiance, our love to Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians talks about the fact in chapter 5 that he died for us so we would live for him. Chapter 11 talks about the fact Paul's worried that the Corinthians might be led astray from simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If anyone does not love the Lord, he is accursed. He is anathema. 1 Peter 1, 8 says, We haven't seen him, but we love him. It is love for Jesus Christ that must be first and foremost, above all other relationships. And verse 26, and above, and above love for self. If you don't hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, Stressing, separating this last one, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Even his own life. Now Ephesians 4 says, no one ever hated his own flesh, but we nourish and cherish our own life like Christ does the church. So again, I'm not thinking about literal hate, give me a give me a lance or a whip so I can whip myself and beat myself up. 
He's talking about in relationship to Jesus Christ, He takes precedent over me. Over my continuing to breathe in this life, as the next, next verse makes clear, and over every area of my life. The word life in verse 26 is the word soul. The idea is not just the physical breath, but the entire being, the entire life. Christ must be more important than your sin, than your comfort, than your ambitions, than your goals, than everything you could think of. He's a high demand. And again, this allegiance for the believer, for the one who comes to him, it's proven by our obedience to follow him. Not that that following is perfect, but it is proven by that. Go to Luke 6, if you would. Luke 16. Come back to the, where we were before. Turn a few pages forward to Luke 16. Different context here, but same basic point. Luke 16, verse 13. The context here is money. No servant can serve two masters. Either he hates the one and loves the other, or he's devoted to one and despises the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. There can't be two masters. There can't be two chief loves. Back to Luke 14. It can't be anything. So the first requirement is you must love him most. Building on this in verse 27, a second requirement, they really go together, there's overlap in these. The second requirement is you must carry your cross and follow Him. Verse 27. Whoever does not carry his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He wants those who are thinking about following Him to understand up front that following me will mean suffering. You must take up your cross and come after me. Now the phrase, you must take up your cross, has lost much of its bite today. <clears throat> Maybe uh, someone could say today, you must tie your own noose. You must sharpen your own guillotine. Although those phrases don't even have enough weight to them, enough bite to them. The cross, as we know as believers, was a place of agony, a place of humiliation, a place of torment, of execution, of ultimate death, of pain, of shame, of agony. And what they make the criminals do, you know, from what they made Christ do, they must take their cross and carry it out to the place they're going to be crucified at. And that would be humiliated. People would be most likely many times saying all sorts of horrendous things against you. It was reserved for the lowliest of the low. Christ hadn't been, yet been crucified on the cross as our Savior, and the cross been exalted, so to speak, as the symbol of our salvation. Christ says you must take up your cross and follow me. You know, taking up the cross and following Christ, he's not talking here, I don't think, about, you know, you get a hangnail. Oh, got a little pain in my nail. Oh, got, a, got my cross to carry. Oh, so hard. Nor is he talking, I think, about the normal, everyday, and even hard sufferings of this life that come to us because we live in a sin-cursed world. He's talking about, I believe, suffering and shame, insults that come with being identified with Jesus Christ, not just from living under the curse. You know, to be on God's side and become a believer means that the world's against you. You're against the world in a sense, and the world's against you. Stephen, you see this all throughout the Old and New Testament. Stephen preaching. What's he say to the Jews? What one of the prophets didn't be persecuted? Throughout the scripture, we see that to follow the Lord will mean difficulty in this life. Go back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. The Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5. He talks about blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the gentle, characteristic of the true believer. They're truly blessed. By the way, why are we truly blessed? Because, look at verse 3, for example. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Not because they have their best life now, but because they're partake of the coming kingdom of Christ. But look at verse 10. Blessed are you when you have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Now note that. Many times the persecution comes for 
the sake of righteousness, for living righteously for the Lord. For, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Verse 11. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all, all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Your reward in heaven is great. Saying it's going to be difficulty to identify yourself with me. To identify yourself with Christ, that means you have to say that men are helpless and hopeless on their own. There's a survey done. Well, the article was just a couple weeks ago in a Christian magazine. There was a survey done of Americans. And according to this survey, 74%, two-thirds of Americans, disagree that the smallest sin will condemn a person. Many Americans are willing to say, yes, we're all sinners, but we're good at heart. If you follow Christ, you must follow Him. That means you must be a learner of His. You must believe what He says. It's not very popular to tell people your good deeds are like filthy garments in God's sight. You can do nothing on your own to earn salvation. But there is hope through a Savior, Jesus Christ. Go to Matthew 13, if you would. Matthew 13, 21, the parable of the soils, the four soils. The third soil, look at Matthew 13, 21, I think this is important to note. The third soil, now this is after the second soil, the rocky place, pops up, but immediately falls away. Verse 21, Matthew 13, 21. Yet he, who had, yet he has no firm root himself, but is only temporary. And when afflictions and persecutions arise because of the word, immediately he falls away. You know, many times the suffering for Jesus Christ, the insults, the shame, the people saying all sorts of evil falsely, hope it's falsely, of us. It's not just because you say you're a Christian. You know, you go out and probably tell almost... I would argue almost everyone in Lincoln. Yes, I'm a Christian. Oh, that's great. Good for you. Good for you. Pat on the back. See you on your way. You know, in verse 21, the persecutions, the afflictions come because of the word. If you just say you're a believer, but you don't really hold to the truth of his word, believe it in all that it says, follow it. It's not going to put you in conflict with the word. We live in a pluralistic society. You can believe in Jesus all you want, as long as you say He's not the only way, as long as you actually don't really believe in Him and follow Him. So don't think that the persecution comes just from saying, yep, I'm a believer, and hide behind the pulpit and throw, throw stones at you. But if you stand for the Lord, you believe His Word, the persecution will come because of the Word. Obviously an example today, high-profile example, sexual sins. You say... No. Any sexual activity outside of marriage, it is sin. It's rebellion against God. That's not going to get you applause. That's going to get you insults, persecutions. And who knows, maybe someday in this country, prison time or worse. Go back to Luke 14. Many other places in the scripture. When Paul, after his first missionary journey, he goes back through and encourages the churches. You know what he encourages them with? He says in Acts 14, 22, he says, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Shows the kingdom is not here yet, and shows we have difficulty until that time comes. 2 Timothy 3, 12, after Paul is saying, I suffer hardship for Jesus Christ. Timothy, you endure hardship too. Suffer hardship. Endure hardship. He says, indeed, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's no escaping it. There's no escaping the difficulty that comes with Jesus Christ. I tell you, go back to Luke 14. If you did, turn back a few pages to Luke chapter 9. For I said this before already in the ministry. I said it a number of times. Luke chapter 9. The context is verse 22. The Son of Man is going to suffer. He doesn't ask us to do anything. He didn't do himself or enable us to do. So verse 23, he was saying to them, if you wish to come after me, you must deny, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. Take up his cross daily and follow after me. He says, if you want to follow me, 
You must deny yourself, say no to self, take up your cross, walk through the streets as it were, identify with Jesus Christ, willing to be insulted in the falsest way, willing to suffer physically and die if needed for Him. I had a friend in college, he made a good observation about this verse specifically. He says, in some ways, it might be easier to be a martyr for Jesus Christ, to give your blood. And the Lord have the strength to do that. And He will strengthen His children to do that if required. But verse 23 specifically is taking up your cross daily. It's harder in one sense to die to self daily. To be willing to have people misunderstand you, say false things about you day in and day out, and day in and day out until glory. That's what, that's what we must do. Back to Luke 14. He said in verse 27, Whoever does not carry his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Are you ready to be crucified for Jesus Christ? Are you ready to be executed? Now, in my own strength, I couldn't do this. In your own strength, you couldn't do this. If the Lord asks you of this, me of this, I believe His grace will enable, His grace will provide. But this is what He wants. This is what He asked Him. You want to go to death for me? You can read church history of believers being tortured in gruesome, almost unrightable and speakable ways because they want to worship Caesar. They want to bow before the Catholic Church. They want to forsake the true Christ. The Lord hasn't called them as a, no any of us at this point to go to prison yet or to die for him. But are you willing to be insulted? To be slandered falsely? To have people misunderstand you? To be humiliated and shamed in the eyes of the world? That's what is involved in crucifixion as well. You must take up your cross and follow me. You know, it's following him and is obedient and obeying him and serving as he served and in suffering in a sense as he suffered. There's an, idea, there's an idea in the church, and this is constant pressure to tone down standing for Jesus Christ. And there's a constant thinking in the church that says, if we're just nice enough, the world has to respect us. The world, my unbelieving friends, have to like me. Now don't misunderstand. We should be at peace with all men as far as it depends on us. We should have good reputation with those outside the church, as far as it depends on us, we don't ask for persecution. But if we live for the Lord, if we obey Him, we should expect misunderstanding and insults. We do one more note before we keep moving on. Um, we shouldn't focus on suffering in a wrong way. We shouldn't try to avoid it, do everything we can to avoid it. I'm going to serve Christ, follow Christ, come on in. Do as well. On the other hand, we shouldn't search for it. Long. Lord, please kill me today. Please, you know, sit for me to prison today. Our focus shouldn't be on the suffering; it should be on serving the Lord. Whatever suffering comes, we'll gladly take it for the Lord's sake. It says you must follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. This truth that Christ presents here, many other places, it goes completely contrary to the prosperity gospel. Believe in Christ and have your best life now. Christ said, believe in me and you might have to go be crucified. You might be insulted. You will suffer difficulty. Now the Lord brings blessings in this life, but our best life isn't in this life. It's in the coming kingdom. It's in the life to come. The felt needs gospel that says, you know, believe in Christ and he'll meet every felt need you have. Well, there's an aspect of truth there. There's the fruit of the Spirit produced in the life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. That's only half the story. It's part of the story. Where is the, take up your cross and follow me, or you can't be my disciple. You must come to the Lord, whatever comes. Let me read what one man said about a hundred years ago about this truth, about this passage. It says, the Lord never said that the Lord never said it would be easy to be a Christian. Never once. We are wrong when, we, when our message, we are wrong in our message and failing to fulfill our mission when we declare that discipleship is easy. There's no difficulties. 
I am convinced that we are failing in our appeal, especially to young life, young people, as he refers to them. When we represent Christianity as a secret to a good life, without representing the difficulties, we shall get hold, we, we shall get hold of young life more successfully when we represent Christianity as Jesus did, as hardship. The cross underlines it from beginning to end. I'm kind of butchered reading that quote. But the point is, it's not easy. When we present it to people, we don't want to skew the picture, bait and switch. When we present Jesus Christ as He is. He gives the two very, very simple illustrations in verse 28 to 32. Illustration of building, illustration of battle. They make the same basic point. You must count the cops. But they hit it from slightly different directions. One hits it from, you must count the cops so you're able to finish. The other hits it from, you must count the cops so you're not defeated. First illustration, verse 28 to 30, illustration of building. He says in verse 28, For which of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, he's not able to finish it, and people are ridicule him. Simple picture says, consider. You know, there's a sense which we present salvation as urgent. Today is a day of salvation. Believe in the Christ, believe in Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. We have to be careful. We don't rush people in without giving them all the all the facts, all the information, so to speak. There's an initial counting the cost. Simple picture: you're building a building. Today you might be building a house. Well, if you have ten thousand dollars in the bank, you don't say, "I'm going to build a house, throw a foundation in, and then I just hope that the studs and the drywall and the paint just." here on top of the foundation. We count the cost in other areas. We must count the cost when it comes to following Jesus Christ. In verse 30, 30 he says, verse 30, 29 and 30, says, not able to finish, he's ridiculed. There's a story of Pilgrim's Progress, a Christian runs after salvation, two men follow after him, obstinate and pliable, obstinate turns back right away. Pliable goes with him for a while, Slightest difficulty comes up, they slip in the slough of the spawn, and he gets himself out and runs back the other way. That's what we're not to do. And what happens when he goes back to the city, whatever the name of the city is? The townsmen insult him and ridicule him. Same thing, someone follows Christ, turns back right away. There's ruin in that, there's no hope. There's possible ridicule even from the unbeliever. Second illustration, same basic point, slightly different angle, verse 32, 30, 31, 32. What king, when he has set out to meet another king in battle, does not first sit down and consider whether he has enough strength with 10,000 to defeat the men of 20,000? Not able to defeat him, he sends delegates for terms of peace. Same basic idea. King going to battle, he has 10,000 troops, opponent has double the troops. Uh-oh, what am I going to do? I better make peace so I'm not destroyed. So he sends out a delegate to make terms of peace. Slightly different perspective, the first illustration so count the cost so you'll be able to finish. I do want to say with that, it doesn't mean we're going to understand every single cost that's required of me as a believer, <coughs> but everything's on the table. Lord, whatever you require of me, I'll give. But here, the man sues for peace so he's not destroyed. Once he's able to finish, take an illustration so he's not destroyed. I don't want to read too much into the illustration, but it is true that we are at war with God in our natural state. Romans 1.18 says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against us. Romans 1.30 says that we're haters of God. Romans 2.5 says that we're storing up in unbelief, the unbelievers storing up wrath for the day of wrath. We have rebelled against God in our sinful state and God's just fiery wrath is on us and will be for all eternity if we don't make peace with Him in this life. The amazing thing about the Gospel is God is the one who has made peace. Romans 5.10 talks about the fact that when we are enemies, in verse 8 of that chapter, when we are sinners, Christ died for us. If we don't count the cost, we will be destroyed. If we don't follow Christ, you might save yourself a little bit of difficulty in this life, but a person has nothing to expect but the terrifying expectation of God's judgment. So count the cost. You can't avoid it not to. And it's the point of the second illustration. Then verse 33, he moves back to discipleship. 
moves back from the illustration. Verse 33. So then, third time he says this, none of you can be my disciples. Again, a disciple is a Christian. Not a super Christian, any Christian. So then, none of you can be my disciples. Third time he's saying this, who does not give up all his own possessions. The third requirement is, you must give up all you have. The first requirement, you must love him most. Second requirement, you must take up your cross and follow him. There's overlapping these, they're all encompassing, they go together. Third requirement, verse 33, he must give up all his own possessions. The word give up here is not the word gift or give away. The word's only used five other times in the New Testament. Two times it's the idea, it's translated bid farewell or say goodbye. The other three times it's used of taking leave of. The idea isn't giving away, but giving up, saying goodbye to leaving. And possessions here, it's not just money. It's not just gold and silver and zeros in a computer. It's not just houses and cars and money and clothes and everything you see with your eyes. The word can include everything. I don't think he's saying here, to me by disciple, you must necessarily sell all you have and take a vow of poverty. You know, Judas had a money box. As Christ taught this, Judas didn't have the money in that box. Christ had clothes on his body. I don't think the Bible ever tells the believer that they have to sell everything they have. Paul writes to Timothy and tells him, instruct those who are rich in this present life not to be conceited, but to be rich in good works, not to trust in their money, but to use their money to serve the Lord. It's not enough to give away your money. 1 Corinthians 13 that if you give away all you have, you could be a martyr. If you don't have love, prophecy you nothing. Bitter kind. First Corinthians 13. What he's saying here is even more radical than taking a vow of poverty. He's saying you must surrender everything to me. There's nothing you can hold on to. Not your family has a greater love, not your life, not yourself, and not your possession, any material things, or anything you have. Again, Luke 16 we saw context of money. You cannot serve God and money. Hate one and despise the other. Many men haven't come to Christ because the cost is too much. The rich young ruler, you can read about it in Luke 18. His money was too important to him. Christ did tell him to sell all he had and follow him. The love of money is what slew that man if he didn't repent. There's a rich fool of Luke chapter 12 you can read about. Very, very wealthy in this earth. But he's a fool in things in regard to God. There's no half-hearted Christianity, half-hearted half discipleship, half-hearted following Christ. And we sing the song sometimes, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. The different verse talks about, I'd rather have him than the applause of men. He is what must be most important. You can't come to him with yourself in your back pocket unwilling to give anything to him. The idea of verse 33, Christ, if you're going to come to me, you're going to be a disciple, all must be mine. The attitude must be, Lord, I and everything I am, everything I have, is yours. In verse 33, it says, so then none of you can be my disciples who does not give up. Give up again is in the present tense here. There is an initial counting of cost as a the parable is the illustration that they point out. But this must remain. The third soil, the parable of the soils, what happens there? The seed pops up for a while, but what happens? The cares of this world, as Mark says, the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things come up as weeds and choke it out. There's an initial count of the cost that a person must count, and it must continue. And that's how he ends it with a parable, another story in verse 34. Another third illustration, it's a warning, verse 34. Therefore, salt is good, but if even if salt becomes tasteless, then what will you season? Then what will it be seasoned? It is useless, either for the soil or the manure pile. It is thrown out. Another illustration that gives a warning. Salt, salt's good, but if salt becomes tasteless, 
what's going on here? From things I've read, salt, sodium chloride, I think, something like that, whatever salt is. From some of the things I read, it says actual salt can't lose its saltiness. So what's going on here? Well, the salt that was used in the area, in Israel, in that area, wasn't pure salt. Other things were mixed in, and the actual salt could be leached out of it, so there's no actual salt remaining. So salt, in that day, that salt they used could become tasteless. And if that happens, there's nothing that can replace or substitute for the saltiness of salt. That's good for nothing. It's useless. Why does he say in verse 35, it's useless either for the soil or the manure pile? The only way that I know how to use salt is for seasoning a little bit and maybe preserving. But some other uses for salt then, and I don't have no idea if it's used this way today, but was for fertilizer, fertilizer, and a manure pile to help the process, I guess, the, the compost pile. One other use, by the way, side note, it could be used as a catalyst for fire. I read it, I haven't tried it. Don't go home and try that. So don't just throw salt on the burner. But he says, if salt becomes saltless, doesn't have a flavor anymore, he says it's useless. You can't substitute what was there, and it's useless. What happens to it, verse 35? It's thrown out. Not even good for the soil. It's completely worthless. What's the point? Salt, if it's not salty, it's useless. It's worthless. It's thrown out. What's the point? In context, the disciple without saltiness, without, in the context, a supreme love for the Lord, carrying the cross to follow Him, has given up all to follow Him, not salty. The essential quality of salt, if it's lost, it's useless. If the essential quality isn't there in a disciple, a supreme love for Him, willing to go through anything for Him, that person is worthless. Nothing can substitute for a love for the Lord. Nothing can replace that. That's what drives the believer on. That can't be replaced like salt can be replaced in salt in the illustration. The person is useless for the Lord for service. And the person like the soul would be thrown out. It's a warning. You're not going to listen to these things I say. I say, you'll be thrown out. And scripture makes clear that's ultimately in the second death, the lake of fire that burns with brimstone forever and ever. It's a place that's horrifying to meditate on. There's no half-hearted discipleship. There's no tagging Jesus Christ onto one's life. <coughs> he ends then, the last phrase of verse 35, He who has an ear, let him hear. An invitation, a call. He who has ears, and the idea is not just physical ears, but spiritual ears, spiritual understanding. He who wants to follow me, let him hear. It's actually a command. It's an imperative. A present tense command. A command from the lips of Christ. Listen up. Don't ignore this. You must listen to what I say. And you can not just listen with the ears, but listen, take into the heart and mind, and submit to. Live in light of. And it's a third person singular command. Who knows how many people are around Christ? Dozens, hundreds, thousands. We don't know as he's traveling. Large crowds. The individual has ears. Let him hear. What was the response of the people? The thousand of people there. You can go and read chapter 15 on your own. Some of them, some of the, in chapter 15 specifically, the tax collectors, the sinners, they were welcoming Christ in their house, kept listening to what he had to say. Because of that, the religious leaders were upset. Why does man mingling with sinners? He gave three amazing parables in chapter 15 about finding the lost, seeking and saving the lost, and the joy that God has in doing that. But out of all the thousands of people that were gathered there, gathered there, who responded? We don't know. Some probably didn't. Some, as we sit here, Almost 2,000 years later, are in Hades, waiting for the resurrection of the wicked. They didn't accept Jesus Christ. Those who did, it's been worth it. Even if they were crucified, even for Peter, the tradition says he was crucified upside down. It's worth it for him. He 
He's been with the Lord for some 2,000 years now and has only better things in his future. Why would you follow Christ? Why in the world would you follow Christ if he's loving him most, suffering and possibly dying, giving up all? Why in the world would a person do that? You summarize by saying, because he is worthy and because it is worth it. He is worthy. He is the great God and Savior. He sustains all things. He upholds all things. He gives you breath. He gives all life breath. He is a gracious God. He is worthy <coughs> of our whole life. And it's worth it for the believer. You read through the Scripture, you see the glory that believers have, not primarily in this life. We have everything working together for good. That's a pretty good reason. All things work together for good to those who love God. But we have the coming kingdom. We have glory to look forward to. We have to look, we can look forward to God's grace, His mercy, His kindness being poured out upon us for all eternity, according to Ephesians 2 7. It's worth it. It's worth it. But there is a cost. You can't come to Him on your own terms. So just three points as we summarize and close. Number one, have you counted the cost? Is Christ your first love? Have you given up all to follow Him? You might not require death by crucifixion. You require, you require to ask for your entire life. It's not works righteousness. It's not you merit salvation. You can't come to Him on your own terms. All except part of Jesus Christ. It's impossible. Have you counted the cost? Have you seen that apart from Christ, there's only... <coughs> Judgment, destruction, and hell for all eternity. But in Christ, yeah, there might be momentary light affliction, but there is eternal life in Him. And a different story, different heart, say, heart, say, uh, heart sayings of Christ in John chapter 6. Christ says some hard things, and people abandoned Him. He turns to his, his disciples and said, Are you going to abandon me too? And Peter said, Where are we going to go? You have the words of life. Have you counted the cost? Is he your first love? If not, flee to him for salvation. He does seek and save sinners. He's doing that today. Believe in him. Accept him as who he is. Number two, believer, you must persevere. There's an initial counting the cost, but from the present tense, ideas throughout. Be careful the weeds don't come up and choke out. Don't be the third soil. Watch out for the weeds, the cares of this life. We must take care of the things in this life. We do love our family, but nothing, nothing, nothing can become more important than the Lord. We must persevere and serve Him. And lastly, as we represent Jesus Christ to people, let us be careful not to present part of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't go to Luke 14 that often when I'm presenting the gospel. But we have to be careful. And we don't have anything we need to go to every truth all the time. We have to be careful we don't bait and switch people. We don't do the person any favor by presenting a false Christ, saying, well, yeah, you just you know, mentally assent that he died for you, and you'll be okay. Don't teach that, do we? No. He must be the Lord that you follow, and it is worth it. And we do Jesus Christ no favors when we do that either. He is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our love. He's worthy of our obedience. So let's just faithfully, regardless of the cost, represent Him to Jesus Christ. He'll save those whom He wills. We beg Him on behalf of Christ. We present the biblical Jesus Christ. We have a great God and Savior. It is difficult to follow Him at times. A whole other lesson. It is worth it though. Glory to come. That's right. All right, thank you for your word. Whether well, maybe handle it accurately, maybe understand it, maybe we not. Look to sidestep it in our own minds and hearts when we submit to it. But if there is anyone here who hasn't come under conviction of sin, hasn't trusted you alone for salvation, hasn't given their life to you, hasn't taken up their cross to follow your son, Lord, may you show them they must do that. He is their only hope. But Lord, it is so worth it. Lord, maybe not 
softer on the truth of your son, may we not shy away from difficulty. You've given us a spirit of power and of love and of discipline. And may we not be ashamed of you, of your son, of your word. Help us by your spirit to do these things. In your son we pray. Amen. Thank you.